Okay, good morning, everyone. Hey, that's a little loud. Is that better? You can still hear me in the back okay? Okay. So just for a couple announcements today, remember the term paper choice of technology, I guess, is now overdue. Um, I will start working on those uh, in the next week and get you feedback by this time next week as to whether your technology and choice is great, if it needs maybe a little bit of refinement, or if you need to choose something else. I will post a note on Blackboard as soon as I'm done going through all of them uh, with instructions on how you can then view my comments and whatnot. So thank you for getting those turned in. Um, I will post the second homework assignment uh, detailing this data storage unit that we're working through uh, sometime in probably the next day or so. I haven't figured out exactly when it will be due. Part of that depends how far we get in lecture today. Um, but I'll post all that as soon as, as I know and I've made a determination. Otherwise, things are just sort of moving along. Does anybody have any questions before we get started today? Yes. You can absolutely use pen on the quiz. You can absolutely use pencil. Just be warned that regrades might be a little bit trickier with pencil, which is to say we may not regrade it. Uh, calculators are allowed as so long as it's not your phone. It has to be like a dedicated calculator with no Wi-Fi, internet, no outside connectivity. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, so if not, then what I want to do is jump back in and, oh, sorry, and I've got two other announcements here. I even made a note to remind me to say them, and then I completely forgot. Um, the TAs have started looking over the first GPS assignment, and just a couple quick notes to, to, to keep in mind as, as, like I said, the second assignment's going to get posted here in the next day or so. Please do not copy off the lecture notes. Okay, so like, I guess it's been not necessarily a common problem, but it's been more than a couple people on some of those first questions on the GPS assignment when asked for, you know, explain this information, just took text verbatim off the lecture notes. Put it in your own words. I don't think that's a lot to ask. Okay? Um, and then the second thing is just be mindful again to make sure you're citing your sources. In particular, Wolfram Alpha counts as a source. If you're using it to help with your assignment, include the screenshot, but then also at the very top of the assignment, just say sources used Wolfram Alpha. Okay? Any questions on those points? All right. Then, what we're going to do is we're going to continue our discussion today about computers and smartphones and tablets and sort of digital devices more generally, picking up where we left off from last time. So on Monday, we spent almost all of the lecture setting the stage for digital devices. What, what, are, what do these computers do? Where did they come from? What have we had historically? And we spent a bit of time talking about computing power. How do, we, how do we define this? What are sort of good things? Where's the state of the art? What are different applications that these computers can be used for? Again, just sort of setting the stage. I don't think I had to convince you that computers and tablets and smartphones are, are useful devices, but I wanted to take a day to do it anyway. And so what we can now do for the beginning of today's lecture is start to think about how do these computers actually work? So, I mean, this is perhaps a bit of a dated picture because does anybody actually use a CRT monitor on their computer anymore? Everybody knows CRT cathode ray tube, old style monitors. But does anybody think this is sort of how the computer works where if, you know, you're sitting there typing on your keyboard and all of a sudden there's all these little men and women that live inside the computer. You know, there's the one here with the trumpet that's going to sound a noise whenever you do something. Here's the people interpreting what you're doing, running instructions up to a computer to put something on a display. Is that how it works? What was that? That's probably how I thought about when I was four. Right? Okay, that's probably how you thought about it when you were four. Uh, if we replaced all these people with mice, is that a better description? No, not really. Okay, so the idea then is what's actually going on underneath the hood? Okay, so just very briefly before we get in, the slides that I've put together uh, in the next couple slides build on a lot of themes discussed in these background readings. I encourage you to go take a look at these. None of them are very technical. I mean, there's a certain amount of technical detail that's needed just to talk about how computers work, and we're going to overview a lot of that in the next couple of slides, but these are really good uh, descriptions of sort of what computers are doing. And certainly, if you're looking for more information about how computers work than what we're going to talk about, there are courses on either computer architecture, or computer organization, something like CSE 220, that will go into an excruciatingly painful amount of detail 
about these processes. But that's where you can go if you want to see some more information. And so what it basically comes down to is this big idea that do you think computers are particularly smart or particularly stupid? Anybody want to take a guess? Do you think your computer is smart? Anyone? Okay, there's yes. Uh, if anybody remembers Clippy, uh, the Microsoft Office assistant from like 15 years ago, do you ever remember Clippy? Do you think Clippy was particularly smart? No, it was usually annoying as, anyway. Uh, and its help usually didn't, didn't really help. What it boils down to, and sort of one of the takeaways from this part of the, of, the, of the course, is that computers are inherently stupid. They really don't know how to do very much. In fact, they don't even really do all that much. In essence, any one of these digital devices, well, again, whether we're talking about a computer, we're talking about your smartphone, we're talking about a tablet, anything, all it basically does is this one cycle. Now, it does it lots and lots of times. It does it over and over and over again. And that enables these devices to work and do all of the things that we know they can do. But inherently, the computer itself is really quite stupid. And so basically, there's a couple things going on here that we can talk about. But this is called the fetch, decode, execute cycle. And what it basically boils down to is anytime the computer does something, don't worry about RAM stands, what that stands for right now. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. It's random access memory. This is just memory on your computer. What the computer is going to do is say, fetch an instruction from memory. So it's going to go to memory, which is maybe storing your program. It's got Microsoft Word, or Adobe Acrobat, or PowerPoint, or Chrome, or Firefox, whatever program you're using. And it's going to say, what's the next thing I should do? Give me an instruction. OK? And so once it takes that instruction, the computer's going to bring that up, and it's going to decode that. Because it's not, the instruction's not going to be as plainly written as, say, uh, load this web page. Okay, if you're thinking about a web browser, that's an instruction you might issue to the browser. But that's not what the computer actually sees when it's actually processing everything. And it's going to take it to this thing called a control unit, and it's going to decode that instruction to say, what is it exactly I need to do? And we'll see that there are actually a very limited number of instructions that the computer understands. But we'll get to that in a few slides. Once it's determined what it needs to do, it comes over to this thing called the ar arithmetic or arithmetic and logic unit, also denoted ALU as an acronym, which then basically says, OK, well, now I know the thing I need to do, so I'm going to do it. OK, so this is where that happens. And the reason it's called the arithmetic or logic unit is that almost all of the instructions that a computer knows how to do are going to, in some way, involve either arithmetic or logic. Engineers, as it turns out, are usually pretty good at naming things. Anyway, and then once this, e this instruction is done, we've successfully executed it, then potentially, depending on what the instruction was, maybe we need to store the result back in memory. OK, so it's, again, think of an instruction as loading the web page. Once you've gotten that web page, do you need to do anything with it? Yeah, you should probably store it in memory and or display it on the screen. So there's some sort of feedback when you're done, again, depending on the in instruction. And once that's done, that's the end of that instruction. What's the next thing your computer is going to want to do? Get a new instruction. OK, I'm done with that task. What's the next task? OK, so the question is, is this sort of how history works in web browser? Web browser, when I say the instruction is loading the web page, is actually much more complicated than anything a computer is actually going to think about. I'm just using it as sort of an illustrative example. So when you ask, is that sort of how history works? In, in a some extent, if we're going to continue this analogy, yes. We're then, you know, somewhere in that memory, you're going to store all of those web pages you've previously been visiting. But in regards to this cycle, that's starting to contort the analogy maybe a little bit more than I would want to. OK, other questions? But this is basically the fundamental idea of how the computer works. And so to, to sort of understand these different pieces together, we can talk about these various things, like what is the RAM? What is memory, and how does that work? What is this arithmetic and logic unit, and how does it work? And so let's start with memory. You've heard of computer memory, or a hard disk, something like that? Does so anybody know what's, what's, what's the disk size on your, I see a lot of you have got your laptops up and open. How much hard disk space do you have on your laptop? What was that? You've got a terabyte. Okay, so you've got a pretty good hard drive right now. 
Anybody? So I see a couple of heads nodding up down. Maybe you've got less than a terabyte. Um, so I've actually, on my laptop, only got 128 gigs. I don't have a lot of files. But that's basically, what do we do with the hard disk? What's the purpose of that? It stores everything. The programs that you use on your computer are stored on the hard drive. All of your documents are stored on the hard drive. Your web browser history is stored on the hard drive. Everything your computer is going to do in some way, shape, or form is stored on the hard drive. Okay? So that's why we need a lot of space. How is that data actually stored? It's stored in this thing called bits. And basically what's going on is that each bit is either a 0 or a 1, figuratively speaking. We mentioned last time that computers are built from transistors. And what the 0 or 1, if we dig into the electrical engineering a little bit, is saying, is this transistor basically on, that's a 1, or is it off, that's a 0. Okay? But the idea is it's this, there's this binary system where we have it's either 0, 1, on, or off. And more importantly, when we start looking at, the, at memory, there's two other key things that we need, sort of listed here in these two items, is first of all, when data is stored in memory, it's sequential. Okay, so what does that mean? There's one item, then there's another item, then there's another item, and another item, and so on and so forth. They're not just sort of randomly scattered everywhere. There's this linear array where all of these bits are stored. And the second point is that the data is addressable. What do you think it means when we say the data is addressable? Yep. So we can track it and we can identify it. So think about, you know, you're going down a street. We've got Main Street. Pick whatever town you want. And we're going down and we're looking at all of the different buildings. And if we were to just say we're on Main Street, so that's a sequential thing. We can just sort of walk down Main Street and there's, here's a building and there's a building and there's a building. Do, they, do all those buildings have addresses? Yeah, that makes it easy to find something. If I tell you, go to 1000 Main Street, can you do that? Okay, maybe you're going to type into Google Maps to figure out should I walk or take a bike, depending on how far down Main Street it is. But everything's addressable. Memory is exactly the same way. And so the, what we've got sort of over here on this figure on the right is now showing in the actual sort of rectangle there, are all of the data values, all of the bits that are stored, and I apologize that it actually put a 7 there, because remember, all of the bits are either 0 or 1. Um, so pretend that 7 is some zeros or 1s, and we'll come back later to how we actually turn that 7 into zeros and 1s. But then moreover, what we see is that each location in memory here has this address. Up at the very top, we have address 0. After address 0, we have address 1, and then address Two, and this is making it both sequential and addressable. And so if the computer now says, oh, I know the instruction that I need, that next instruction I need to execute is at memory location 14, is that something we can easily look up and get? Yeah, we just go to location 14 in this figure in this drawing right there. We're going to pull whatever is stored at that place in memory, and that's what we're then going to execute is our instruction. Okay. So for a little bit more terminology, each bit, or each one or zero, is called a bit. And a few other things that you'll see commonly if you start digging into computers and whatnot is that there's this thing called a byte, B-Y-T-E, which is eight bits. And uh, sometimes people will also define a word when talking about computers, which is usually four bytes, or 32 bits, if you want to back all of that out and, and do all the multiplication. Uh, so I say usually this gets into a realm of computer architecture where historically a word has been four bytes. More modern computers have moved from what's called a 32-bit architecture to a 64-bit architecture. If anyone has a Mac that's more than about mm, six or seven years old, you're sort of in the range where half of the Macs were 64-bit machines and half were 32. Everything has now pretty much moved over to 64-bit architectures where they've sometimes, sometimes redefined the word to then be eight bytes, which would give you the 64 bits, but some people still maintain that it's four because of historical reasons. So as I say, usually, I'm not even sure how true that is anymore. Um, historically, a word is four bytes, but that's up for debate. Um, 
So anyway, just to keep in mind, those are some terms that, that we'll see from time to time. And so then for our question, looking at this figure, you know, what value is stored? If we look in memory at address 13, what value do we have? We've got 7, exactly as we saw before, because we can come over and say, whoop, there's address 13, and when we look there, the value stored in memory is a 7. Okay. So just for a joke, um, as we've seen sort of when we're talking about hard disk, we've got terabytes, we've got gigabytes, we've got megabytes. Metric prefixes are often used to make bigger uh, bytes, to make it easy to talk about bigger quantities of data. And there's a joke sometimes on how do you define kilobyte. Because normally you would think kilo is the metric prefix for 1,000. So if I said this is one kilobyte, how many bytes is that? 1,000. That is not actually what happens. A kilobyte is 1,024 bytes. Anybody want to know, besides the fact that maybe engineers are thrifty, which we've already said a moment ago they're not, why is a kilobyte 1,024 bytes and not just 1,000? Right, because computers work in binary. We've got these zeros and ones, and 1,024 is a power of 2. Specifically, it's 2 to the 10th. And so whenever they try to make divisions and try to make these numbers up, they try to find a power of two because it simplifies a lot of things underneath the hood that we're not going to take the time and detail to go over. But for that reason, a kilobyte is actually 1,024 bytes. And a megabyte is 1,024 kilobytes, or if you wanted to figure out 1,024 squared bytes, and so on and so forth. But anyway, so there's an XKCD comic a while ago talking about... Uh, different ways to define a kilobyte. I particularly uh, liked the Baker's kilobyte where you get nine bits to the byte since you're such a good customer. But anyway, moment of comic relief. So thinking about memory, so that's the idea of memory. We've got all of these bits, and they're stored in the sequential and this addressable way. Now digging in, if you've purchased a computer recently or you've done some, some digging, we've mentioned that there's the hard disk which is usually quite large, maybe on the order of 100 gigabytes to a terabyte presently. There are other types of memory. So we've seen random access memory or RAM. Does anybody know typically how much RAM a computer has right now? Eight what? OK, so eight gigabytes is pretty common. Some might still have four. I think some of the very cutting edge machines right now are starting to move to 16. Um, but that's typically what most computers, if you were to just go to Dell or Apple, you're going to get probably about eight gigabytes of memory which is substantially less than the 128 gigabytes or the one terabyte that you might get on the hard disk. Well, if these are all different ways of storing information, why do we have these different things? Why do we need both memory and a hard disk? Oh, okay. So one of the answers is maybe we want to store different things on the memory of the hard disk. Maybe in the process of doing whatever computation, whether it's Word or something that we're doing, we have some temporary result. We don't actually care about storing it on the hard disk as part of our file structure, but we need that to do something later with the web browser. And so we can just put it in memory as sort of like a scratch pad. Something like that? OK, that can be one reason, and that does happen in practice, but that's not actually the primary reason why we have these two different or, or various things. You may want to take a, another guess as to why? OK, everything comes down to, when we talk about engineering and trade-offs, it all co always comes down to one principal factor. Just like everything else in life always comes down to one principal factor. Anybody want to guess what it is? Money. OK, as it turns out, there's a trade-off. As we go, so there's sort of this, this hierarchy here, and we've got this pyramid on the slide. And basically what happens is, think of everything here at the top of the, of the pyramid. This is really good from a computation perspective. It's very fast, it's very efficient, and it's going to able, enable quick processing. But that comes at the cost of being very expensive. Okay? And so we can have CPU registers. This is actually what the computer, what, your, what the arithmetic logic unit is going to work with, are these registers. And there's maybe only like an order of 10 to 100 on most, most processors. There's not that many. This thing called cache, we'll come back to that. A little bit lower is this thing called RAM. And so as this pyramid gets broader, what this is saying is that the RAM can store more information, but it's not as efficient. 
It takes the computer longer to access the memory, which slows down the efficiency of your computer, but memory is a lot cheaper. And so we can have a lot more of it. And so rather than having maybe only a couple bytes or a couple kilobytes, as we might have sort of in registers or in cache, we now have gigabytes in memory. But yet we still see memory is much smaller than a hard disk. We can come down to this next level here. We see the sort of storage device types. And notice we have you know, hard drive over here on the right. Hard drives can have hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes, worth of storage. But they're even slower to access. When the computer needs to take something from the hard disk and use it, that's even slower than memory, but it's also a lot cheaper. I mean, does anybody want to take a guess? If you were to go out and buy like a one terabyte hard drive, anybody order of magnitude how much that costs? OK, maybe 80 bucks if you've got a sale. I was thinking more probably about 200, depending. Externals are probably cheaper, but they're going to be even slower than one that's internal, but yeah. Right, so this also depends. There's different types of hard drives. So most terabyte hard drives that are out there use this old style approach where there's actually a cylinder in the hard drive, which is why it's called a disk. And it actually has to spin around to make all the points accessible, which tend to be very slow. Does anybody know on your computer, do you have a sort of a traditional hard drive or do you have what's called a solid state drive? Okay, so you've got both. You've got, really, you've got both. But I'm guessing the one terabyte is not solid state. No, that, that's expensive. <laughs> Um, there's a new technology that's been coming out on the scenes about the last 10 years called a solid state hard drive. They tend to still be a little bit slower, or a little bit um, smaller. So like my 128 gig is a solid state, but that's why mine is only 128. The solid states tend to be a lot faster. Um, they're really, there are no physical, physical moving parts, which then makes it a lot faster for your computer to still access the data. Um, but the hard disks tend to be cheaper, so they can store more data, they've got bigger capacity, and they're cheaper. And then we have, you know, you can think of other sorts of input sources. Um, so maybe you've got some scanner, camera, you've got removable media. You've used a flash drive. That would be sort of removable media here. You can think of the internet as being like a remote source or some network. And can the internet store more than a hundred, more than a terabyte? Oh yeah. Internet's way larger than one terabyte. Does it, but then again, is it also cheaper? Okay. Assume, so you're here on campus, you've got Wolfie Net Secure. Are you paying anything for that storage? Not necessarily. But is it slower than your hard disk or memory? Yeah, the network is inherently slow. And so that's sort of the trade-off here. Is you've got all of these different components working together of sort of saying, how good are they from a computation perspective? Are they really efficient and really easy to access things towards the top versus how much can they store with things on the bottom having a lot more? And so when we look at sort of this memory hierarchy, there are all these different levels that appear here to try to speed things along and, and keep things going. And so the real answer, why do we have both the memory and the hard disk? Memory is smaller, but it's easier to access. So we'll keep things that we know we're using in memory. Every time you boot up your computer, do you load, well, I was going to say, do you turn on Firefox or Chrome, but I'm guessing the answer is yes. Uh, do you open up Microsoft Excel every time you power up your computer? No, probably only when you have a, a, a homework assignment due that requires that, that sort of functionality. So do we need to keep Microsoft Excel relatively close to the processor, like by putting it in memory, or can we just leave it sitting on the hard disk because we're not touching it? We can do that. And so that's where the trade-off comes in. When we look at memory, we're going to bring in the things that we're actively using. Maybe Chrome or Firefox, maybe Microsoft Word. Where do you think your operating system, whether you're using Windows, Linux, or one of the Mac OS variants, where do you think that lives? In the, in the hard disk or in memory? OK, so you put it on the SSD. It's actually going to go into memory. That's when you turn on your computer, does it instantly start working, or does it take it 30 seconds or maybe a minute to boot up? It takes a little bit of time to boot up. That's because what your computer is doing is moving all of that operating system information, which is very key to your computer's functionality, from the hard disk, where it's permanently stored, into memory, where it can be a little bit closer and easier to work with. And sometimes that just takes a little bit of time on the order of maybe 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how your computer's configured. Which is then sort of the last uh, distinction here. You'll notice here on the, on the right of the pyramid, it shows that this cache in memory, this RAM, is what's called a temporary storage area, versus the hard disk is now a permanent storage area. This has to deal with power. Hard disks are designed to be persistent, which is to say if you turn off the power on your computer, do you lose all of the information on your hard drive? Generally speaking, no. 
if you do something went horribly wrong. I've had that happen to me before. It's not fun. However, if you turn off the power on your machine and you reboot it, do you lose everything that's stored in RAM? Yes, you do. Which is why when you reboot your computer, it has to move everything back into memory. The moment the power goes down, you lose what's in RAM or in the cache or in any of those higher level areas. They require power to constantly be flowing to maintain what they're storing, which is also one of the reasons why they're a little bit more expensive. Okay, so any questions on sort of computer memory for what's going on? Again, big idea, big scratch pad, stores lots of ones and zeros. So now, thinking about computer instructions. So what is it the computer actually does on all these things? So there's really only about four typical instructions that a computer will execute. And they're not even really that complicated in a conceptual sense. One is transfer data, doing loads or stores. So do we need to get whatever that, we want to open Microsoft Excel, is that already in memory? No? Okay, well the instruction is let's move it from hard disk to memory to make it more accessible. That's an instruction that we could execute. We can compare things. So for instance, we've got two numbers stored and we want to know is five greater than three? The answer obviously is yes, but we can compare those different things. Again, not usually that difficult. We can add data really easily if we wanted to add those two integers. So we said, let's add 5 and 3. Naturally, we get 8. That's something a computer can do. Uh, sometimes computers are good at multiplying things, but in most practice, they're going to turn multiplication into a whole bunch of additions. Adding, as it turns out, is easy. And then the last thing, that the, the instruction that you might get, is actually just changing the location of the next instruction. So the computer is always going to have one of those registers at the very top of that pyramid dedicated to saying, what is the next, what's the address of the next instruction I need to get? Okay? And so it's possible, depending on what we do and what, how we interact with our programs, we need to change that to say, oh, well, instead of taking the next instruction from address 15, take it from address 27 instead. And that's an instruction that the computer can execute. That's it. I'm, I'm not really oversimplifying here. That is basically as smart or as stupid as your computer is. It knows how to do those four things. And so one of the questions then that we're going to start to develop, at least in some way, is you know, how does this lead? If that's all the computer can do and that's exactly how smart they are, how does this give us Microsoft Word or Excel or the Internet or, frankly, Angry Birds? Because when you're playing Angry Birds or you're using Microsoft Word, are you thinking, oh, compare these two numbers, add these two numbers, change the location of that instruction? Do you have to worry about any of those details necessarily? No. So how does that all get done? Well, the short answer is we've got these really great programming languages and computer scientists that know how to program things and translate what you want to do through a computer program into what the computer can actually execute and then display the results back to you. That's what Word is actually doing. That's what Excel is actually doing. That's what web browsers are doing. You click on the, on the bar and type in a URL and hit enter. The web browser knows to say, oh, well, that means you want me to go load that web page. Well, then it turns that into, an, into a whole bunch of computer instructions into loads and stores and process and things to go get that web page, get it back, and then process it and display it on the screen for you. But that's what your programs are doing, are basically turning what you want the program to do or the action you want performed into this series of instructions of very simple things. So for sort of the, the existential computer question then, is we said memory stores all of everything, okay, and it's all in zeros and ones. If a computer then says, oh, well, the next instruction I need to execute is at, you know, address 13, how does the computer know when it actually goes to memory, looks up what's stored at address 13, that what's stored there is actually an instruction? That it's not, I don't know, a data file? That it's not some other program? That it's not just something stored temporarily in memory? How does the computer know that that's the instruction sitting there at address 13? I'll give you a hint. Computers are really stupid. This might very well be a trick question. It has no idea. The computer doesn't know at all. 
And so what it's going to do is it's going to say, well, if it tells me, go read memory address 13, and that's the instruction, it's going to load memory address 13, and it's going to interpret as an, it as an instruction. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. What do you think is going to happen if at address 13 is actually stored uh, the PDF file that you turned in on Monday for the GPS unit, and the computer tries to execute that, what do you think is going to happen? You're probably going to get an error. Um, because that's not necessarily an instruction. The computer can interpret it as one just fine. An instruction is just a series of zeros and ones. Your PDF file is just a series of zeros and ones. No issue. But it's going to give sort of unpredicted behavior because that was never intended to execute. And so in certain cases, there are various things that this might do. At the very least, what's going to happen is you're going to say, well, somehow memory got corrupted, and maybe you're going to get a blue screen of death. Anybody seen the blue screen of death on their machine? This might be what happened. At some point, something got off in the computer, and it caused a, a bad instruction. Computer's like, uh-oh, I don't know what to do. Something's really, really wrong here. Crash. That happens. OK? And that's sort of, at best, that's the behavior. And, and in a lot of cases, what that means is, if, if anyone's heard there's a bug in the program, anybody heard that term before? OK. Does anybody know where that term bug in the program came from, comes from? Yes. So going back historically, does anybody, ever, anybody heard or seen or used punch cards? So if you go back you know, 40 years, 50 years, to computing, the way you would feed instructions in the computer wasn't so much using a keyboard and a disk or the internet. You actually literally had you know, maybe a 5 by 8 card that you'd punched a bunch of holes into, and you would feed that into a reader. The reader would then look at where are the holes on the card, and that would then specify what's the instruction that we should do and, and what do we need to happen. And it turned out one of these early computers, a literally an insect, got in the card reader and jammed everything up. And so the computer started getting all sorts of weird instructions because the bug guts were now in, like, contaminating everything. And so that led to what was called buggy code. Uh, and that term has persisted now for 50 years or whatever. But anyway, so this type of behavior is at best called a bug, and that's just maybe sloppy programming or at least unintentional programming. And those things are relatively easy to fix. So you've seen from time to time, Microsoft pushes down an update, and you have to update Word or Excel. Maybe they're adding more functionality, but in a lot of cases, they found, oh, here were unintentional problems that we had, and we've now fixed them. OK? Same thing happens when your operating system needs an update. They might be doing this as well. At worst, this type of behavior could actually be the result of a computer virus or some malicious piece of code that is now actually designed to try to hijack your system or get your data or something like that. But this is, these are sort of the things that happen because computers are stupid. We don't know that this is actually an instruction or this is memory or this is a file. It doesn't matter. Everything is just stored as zeros and ones. Okay. So takeaway, computer is really stupid. Any questions so far? All right. So then our driving question for this unit is we're thinking about data storage. Is that we know, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that we store on computers. We've got our documents, spreadsheets, presentations. We store pictures. We store music. We store websites. We store uh, games. We store other programs. People store other things. I think that's a pretty exhaustive list, but I, I, I doubt it's got everything. OK, but the point is there's lots of those things. To us as people, are any of those objects intrinsically zeros and ones? No. When I think of, oh, I have to open up this Word file, do I just start typing zero and one into Word and suddenly sentences start appearing? No, that's, no, that's not how I work. Is that, do any of you work that way? Good, I'm glad to see no hands go up. OK. So what we're going to be concerned with for the rest of this unit, um, the next couple lectures, is how do we think about converting these various objects into zeros and ones? We know it's possible because we know we can store documents and spreadsheets and presentations on our computer and pictures and music and websites. How does this actually work? How do we take these things that as humans we do not regard as intrinsically zeros and ones and then turn them into these zeros and ones that can actually get stored and processed? Okay. And so that's what we're going to focus on. And the answer on how this actually works is it depends what is it we're actually trying to store. We're going to spend a bit of time, certainly the rest of today and probably a little bit of time on Monday, 
talking about simply integers. How do we store integers as zeros and ones? It turns out once we have that, it's a little bit more straightforward to now think about all of these other objects using what we do there for integers. Okay? But we can start there and we can sort of systematically build up, starting from something that's relatively simple, going to more complex, to see how these things would get turned into these sequences of zeros and ones. So if we were to start, like I said, we're not even going to get to integers immediately. We're going to start with just non-negative integers. And so here's some numbers, 0, 1, 2, 14, 179. How would you think about turning those into sequences of zeros and ones? Take a moment and, and think. I think someone just sort of quietly said the, the answer that we're going to discuss. Okay, well, how would we turn zero into a sequence of zeros and ones? Do we actually need to do anything? No, it's already zero. What about one? Same difference. It's, it's, it's already there. Uh-oh, but now we get to two. Oh, man. So what, anybody have any ideas on what we can do? Yep. We can use binary numbers. Okay, And so I'm going to put up here, we'll come back to these examples in a little bit, but we can turn, okay, 0 and 1 to stay. We can use what are called binary numbers to turn these integers into zeros and 1s. So 2, for instance, might come, become 1, 0. Don't think that that's 10. In this particular case, that is 2. 14 can be 1, 1, 1, 0, and 179 might become 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And so what I want to spend certainly the rest of today talking about um, is how we do this, and how do we get from 179 to 1011, 0011. Okay? And the trick here is we're using binary numbers. So to, to motivate what binary numbers are, let's step back, and we're used to working with what are called decimal numbers, or the base 10 system. And so if we think about that number 179, um, I know when I was back in elementary school, one of the exercises that we would have would be take 179 and you had to write it out as 100 plus 70 plus 9. Or, so you could think about expanding this in that way as sort of saying 179 is equal to 1 times 100 plus 7 times 10 plus 9 times 1. And notice that what's going on is that this 1 comes right there. This 7 gets carried to there. And then the 9, I've got to cross lines here comes over there. And so what that 179, when we write it in that form, is telling us how many ones we have, how many tens we have, how many hundreds we have, et cetera. If we needed another digit for thousands or ten thousands or hundred thousands, fine. And so the question is, as we start to think about this and say, what's the pattern? What do one, ten, one hundred, one thousand, what do they all have in common? They're all what? They all have a one, but maybe a little bit more specifically. They're all, not necessarily multiples of 10, they're powers of 10. Okay, so notice, 1 is 10 to some exponent. What is that exponent for 1? It's just 0. So I'm cross that out and put 0. 10 is equal to 10 to what exponent? 1. 100 is 10 squared, and so on and so forth. And so this is the idea of sort of saying, let's look at the powers of our particular number and then think about expanding our number now here, this 179, in terms of how many of each of those powers do we need to make that number. Okay? And so when we think about binary numbers, this is exactly the process we're going to use, but instead of using 10 as that base, and notice that this decimal system was called base 10. When we go to binary, what base are we going to use instead? We're going to use 2. Okay? So the question is, what's so special about 10? Nothing. Why, do we, why did we, as the human civilization, why did we develop and why are we most used to using base 10? Most people have 10 fingers. Alternatively, most people have 10 toes. You can use whichever one you want. The idea is most people have 10 digits, and so that was the natural starting point. Okay, makes sense. But what if we use base 2? There's nothing wrong with that, just a different choice. So for reference, I include on the slide here, here are a whole bunch of powers of 2, uh, up from 2 to the 0 up to 2 to the 11. What you can notice sort of building on our conversation just a moment ago 
is again, you can see here that that 2 to the 10th is equal to 1,024. And so that's where that kilobyte comes from. Because again, that's a power of 10, or a power of 2, excuse me. OK? And so the trick now, when we want to think about taking that number, that 179, which is in decimal, it's in base 10, and converting it to base 2, what we're really trying to do is this expansion down here at the bottom of the slide. So we want to take this 179, and we want to write it as something times maybe 128. Notice, that's a power of 2. Plus something times 64. The next power of 2 smaller, plus something times 32, et cetera, all the way down to something times 1, which is our 2 to the 0. Okay? So just like we had in the base 10 where we had the hundreds and then tens and then ones being decreasing powers of 10, we're going to do the same thing now just with powers of 2. And again, at the very, very bottom of the slide, there's a tutorial, uh, another website that has a, a good discussion of this if you're looking for more information. But we'll discuss. So some questions that we need to deal with. If we look now, so there, I moved the expansion again to the top of the slide. What are the possible values for each of those pound signs? When we said we had something times 128 and something times 64, 32, et cetera, what are those somethings? Okay. So think back to base 10. When we said you know, like 179 was something times 100 plus something times 10 plus something times 1, what were the possible digits that we could have in each of those cases? Well, could we have a 0? Yep, could we have a 1? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. How many choices did there end up being for any one of those digits? We had 10, 0 through 9. Is that a coincidence that in base 10, we had 10 choices for each digit? No, it isn't. And the reason why is suppose now we put a 10 in the ones digit. Could we potentially do that? Sure, we can say there are 10 ones. But a better way of saying that is that there is 110. And so by convention, we don't do that. We say if there's more than nine ones, we just add one into the tens unit. Think back to carrying when you were doing addition some time ago. But that's what's going on. And so in base 10, there are 10 options. So when we're now thinking about base 2, these binary numbers, how many choices do you think we're going to have for each of those signs? Or for each of those hash, or each of those pound signs? Well, there's going to be two. And specifically, they're going to be? 0 and 1. Because if we have two ones, instead of saying that's two ones, we could, we could write that as 1, 2. And if we had two twos, well, that's just 1, 4. And two fours is 1, 8. And so on and so forth. And so in this way, by using these binary numbers in this expansion, we can now take any non-negative integer, and we can write it as a sequence of zeros and ones by basically looking at this expansion and then taking all of these little hash signs, or pound signs, and writing them out sequentially, just like we did. So 179 was 1 times 100 plus 7 times 10 plus 9 times 1. Read them off in that order, and that's going to be our number now represented as a sequence of zeros and ones. Okay? So I think on the next slide we've got some examples. Right. So how do we actually go about doing this process? First of all, does anybody have any questions over the idea before we get into how this actually works? Yep. So it's pr that depends on the architecture. I don't know. Um, my guess is in various, in various times and places, it's doing either or. Certainly, it might have some really simple ones just stored in a table that it can look up. My guess is it's probably, in most cases, just doing the actual computation. This isn't hard. Um, but so like when your computer, when you go in an Excel and you've input a number in your spreadsheet, let's say you have 179, Excel, one of the things that your program is doing is converting this, these zeros and ones to a 1, a 7, and a 9 to display to you. That's something Excel as the program is having to do. Okay? All right. Other questions sort of conceptually? Yeah. Um, how do we know Okay, so how do we know which exponent? That's a great question and a perfect segue to this slide. But before we move on, let's see if there are other questions conceptually. But thank you for the segue. Other questions? Okay, so then how do we, how do we actually go about doing this? 
So there's a couple steps that we can use. And so we'll continue using 179 as our example. And the first thing that we need to do, again, yay, step one, is determine what is the largest power of two smaller than the number that we have. OK, so we can go back a slide, well, two slides. And so if we're starting with 179, when we look at this table of powers of 2, what's the smallest power of 2, or sorry, what's the biggest power of 2 that's smaller than 179? 128. It's 128. Because we notice here, there's our 2 to the 7th. And if we go to 2 to the 8th, 256, that's too big. For any fans of The Price is Right, that's too much. If you don't watch The Price is Right, then you don't get that reference, and that's fine. OK. So in this case, for this example of 179, that's 128. So what we can do now, sort of here as, as noted on step two, is we could put a 1 in that digit. And notice that I've gone ahead and updated that up here on the slide. So we know that 179 has 1 128 in it. OK. So now, cool, we're done with one of these digits. We now have a, let's see, there's the 64, 32, we've, what is it, about seven of them left. So how do we then think about going through and, and, and figuring out what are those other pound signs? Well, we can come down to step three. And so what we're going to do is we're going to subtract off that 128. So again, you could think about just from an arithmetic standpoint of just moving this over to the other side and saying, well, we know there's that one 128. Get rid of it. What's left? And how do we expand that number in terms of the zeros and ones? And so when we do in this particular operation, 179 minus 128 just gives us 51. Please verify my arithmetic afterwards. I think that's right. OK. And so what we can then do is continue using this number. Now our goal is we need to convert 51 to binary. Now, the one caveat that might happen at this point, since we're now sort of continuing with this number, is noting that some powers of 2 might need to be skipped. So if we go and ask ourselves, so again, we've got some powers of 2 up at the top. What's the biggest power of 2 smaller than 51? It's 32. Is that the next power of 2 that we see in our expansion? No. So then that sort of answers the question, how many 64s do we have in this case? Are there any 64s in 51? No. So what digit are we going to put there? We're going to put a 0. OK? And so we can continue doing this process, these sort of steps 1 through 3, until literally we've subtracted everything off. And we've, as we sort of subtract all these things off, we just get 0 at the end. And so what we end up getting in this expansion, we see that we have 1, 128. We've already seen 0, 64s. Is there that 32 in 51? Yeah, do we have any 32s in 51? Yep. Let's actually maybe move over to the more whiteboard here and work this through. Okay. So we can have, you know, so we started... So we started with 179, we subtracted off that 128, and we were left with 51. And so we could see that was a 1 in the 128th digit. And we already saw there are no 64s left, being our next power of 2. The next power of 2 is, a, is 32. Are there any 32s in 51? Yep. So we can put a 1 down here denoting that. We then need to subtract off that 32. And what are we left with? Any arithmetic fans? 19. What's our next power of 2 smaller than 32? 16. Are there any 16s in 19? Yep. So we've got another one. So we take, off, take our 19, subtract the 16 off, and we get 3. Our next power of 2 is, is 8. Are there any 8s in 3? Nope. So we put a 0, move on. What's the next power of 2? 4. Are there any 4s in 3? Nope, so we get another 1, or another 0, excuse me. What's the next power of 2? 2. Are there any 2s in 3? Yes. So we can put a 1. 3 minus 2 leaves us with 1. Our, our next and ultimately last power of 2 is 1. Are there any 1s in 1? Yep. So we put a 1. 1 minus 1 equals 0, and we're done. Okay? 
And so if we were to go back over, so the binary number that we would use for 179 is now reading off those digits in order 10110011. We'll come back to the slide here and actually see that maybe a little bit more clearly. Okay? And so sure enough, writing out that expansion, so we had, there's that 1, 128, the 0, 64, the 132, 116, and so on and so forth. And what we're doing to write the binary number is just pulling these coefficients down in order. So notice that 1 at the very left end of that, one of that base 2 number is the 128th digit, immediately followed by the 64's digit, immediately followed by the 32's, and so on and so forth, going all the way down to that 2 to the 0 or to that 1's term at the very end. But that's where the binary number comes from. Question. How do you determine what base you're going to use? Right now, we're just going to use base 2. Binary numbers always mean base 2. In a few slides, it probably won't happen today, but next time we'll talk about other bases, just to serve a neat math idea. But for right now, when we say binary, that means base 2. Just as much as decimal means base 10. Okay? So we can clean all of this up. So for a moment of comic relief, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that this question is using binary? What's a 4? Okay. Equivalent question, there, there are 1, 0 types of people in this world, those who know binary and those who don't. And that's funny because 1, 0 in binary is 2. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so coming back to the example we started with, only I've swapped out one of the numbers because we've already detailed 179. How do we convert these numbers to binary? Okay, so we've already seen zero is pretty straightforward because are there any powers of two in zero? No, everything's just zeros. Okay, so if we wanted to think about doing one, what is the biggest power of two smaller than or equal to one? It's one. And how many ones are there in one? There's one. And so one becomes one. I know that was a lot of ones in that sentence as I fly around with this pen. Okay, so now for two, what's the biggest power of two that we have to consider? Not eight. It's two. So we know that this is going to be equal to some number times two plus some number times one. And how many twos are there in two? There's one. What does that leave us with after we subtract off that two? Zero. And so the number that we end up getting in binary is just one zero. Okay? So there's the there are ten types of people in this world, those who know binary and those who don't. There's where the ten came from. It's not ten, it's two. Okay, so now for fourteen, I can erase this down a little bit. What's the biggest power of two we're gonna need if we want to think about fourteen? It's eight. So what we know is that we're going to have something times 8 plus something times 4 plus something times 2 plus something times 1. And so are there any 8s in 14? Yep. So we can put a 1 in that 8s digit. And 14 minus 8 leaves us with 6. Are there any 4s in 6? Yep. So we can put a 1 there. 8 subtract off that 4 leaves us, or sorry, this is a 6. 6 subtracting off the 4 leaves us with 2. Are there any 2s in 2? Yep, so we put a 1 in that digit, subtract off the 2 from 2, leaving us with 0. Are there any 1s in 0? Nope. So we put a 0 there, and when we read off those digits in order, we end up getting 1, 1, 1, 0. And that's 14 in binary. Okay? We're not necessarily going to go through 2017 in, in that level of detail. Um, it might take a little while. Maybe I'll ask the question while I'm erasing. What's the biggest power of 2 we need to, to do 2017? It's 1,024. And it turns out when you, when you end up converting it, you get 1111111000001. And I know if I were to show this to you, you were all immediately thinking, oh, that's just 2017. Another tool that can be very useful yeah, sorry, before we get there, there's a, there's a question. Okay, we'll come, we'll come to that in a moment. 
OK, so another tool that can be somewhat useful in certain cases is that Wolfram Alpha can do these base conversions for you. OK, as a note on this, I think it's perfectly fine if you want to use Wolfram Alpha to check your work. There are going to be some questions about doing base conversions on the homework. There will probably be a quiz question on the appropriate quiz trying to do this where you will not have Wolfram Alpha. My advice, use Wolfram Alpha only to check your work. You need to know how to do these conversions by hand. What I promise you, though, is on the quiz, you're not going to get something like 2017. OK, that's going to take five or 10 minutes, which is more than we need to get into. Um, but you can certainly type it in. And so notice that you now get, here's the 2017 in base 2. Again, always check this little input interpretation box. And it now says convert 2017 to base 2. And it gives you the result there. And there was a, a question just a moment ago sort of noticing that there's this little subscript 2 at the end of that number. Anybody want to take a guess what that 2 is signifying? It's base 2. So we could equivalently have written this number also as 2017 subscript 10, indicating that that 2017 is in base 10. OK, so sometimes you'll see that subscript. In certain contexts, like when we're saying convert this number to binary, you can probably assume I gave it to you in decimal. I will try to be as clear as possible. If context isn't clear, please ask. OK? But the two systems that we're mostly going to be working with in this class are going to be decimal, because that's what we as humans are used to working with, and binary, because that's what a computer wants to work with. OK? Any questions on that? OK. If not, then we can move on. And we can also go the other way around. What if I gave you a number in binary and asked you, how do we convert that back to decimal? It's the exact same idea goes along, where we can think about writing out and saying, so now we're given this number, this 101100011. OK, you're telling me again, yeah, that's just 179. We're beating this example to death. I get it. But what we can do is think about expanding that and say, well, this 1 up here says, well, that's 1 times 128 plus 0 times 64 plus 1 times 32, plus 16, and so on and so forth. And what we can do is just multiply all those out and add them up. And that's sort of what's uh, symbolically going on in this image here. The question is, how do we know that that first one, the one right there, how do we know that that was the 128th digit? Right, so what you need to do is start counting from the right. What we know is that in these binary numbers, whatever the rightmost digit is, is going to be our 2 to the 0 digit. That's our 1's digit. And the digit immediately to the left of that is going to be the 2's digit. And the digit immediately left of that is the 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and in this example, 128. So that's where this gets maybe a little bit tricky, is sort of recognizing what is that first 1. Start at the right, work your way back up. OK? But that's all that's going on. And so I'll put the comment here on the bottom, just as something, as we, as we move forward throughout this unit, this will, this will come back and sort of be a theme. The key thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about these digits and binaries is that each of those digits, every 0 and 1 in that number, has a specific meaning. Again, it's telling us how many of that particular power of 2 is needed in whatever number that we're trying to represent. Okay? And so this idea of these digits have meaning is going to be very important when we continue this discussion um, next time and start going beyond these non-negative integers. Okay, So we can do a few examples real quick. So how would we convert the binary number 1010101? How would we convert that back to base 10? Right. Not quite 10. So remember, what we need to do here, so we start at the rightmost digit. Let me put the pen back on. And we know that that's, this is signifying, that 1 is saying that there is 1, 1 in our number. Our next digit over this 0 is the 2's digit. Do we have any 2's? Nope, so nothing to do. 
This next one specifies how much in our number. Right. So we have a 4. Our next digit, or our next power of 2 is an 8. So do we have any 8s that we need to worry about? Nope, we skip it. Next one down tells us 16. We've got one of those. Do we have any 32s? Nope, so we can just sort of discard that. And then our last digit is a 64. And so what we can do is take all of these digits that had the 1 in front of them, add those together. These give us, what is that, 85. So we ultimately get 85. OK? But again, remember, start at the right and work your way left. That way you know what each of those digits is corresponding to. What do you mean we're not done yet? Right, so decimal is just base 10. And so by doing that, this is now 85 in base 10. And we can do the same thing for all of these other ones. So the 1100101 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 is just 101. 1101 1, 0, 1 is 13, and 100 0, 0 is just 4. And again, if you want to use Wolfram Alpha to check your work and verify that things are going correctly, it can also do base conversions in this direction. But you have to be a little bit clever and say, well, we start with 1010101 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 from base 2. Again, telling Wolfram Alpha that is a binary number to base 10. Again, check your in interpretation. So now it says convert. Here's the number. Notice it puts that 2 subscript indicating it recognizes that's a binary number. Convert it to base 10. And lo and behold, what it comes up with is exactly what we expected, and that's 85. Yep. So I think that is the perfect place to end our discussion for today. If you will please put your notebooks and everything away. You can keep a calculator out, writing utensil, and it is quiz time. A note here, um, there's this sheet of possibly useful information. I'm going to put it up on the projector here, magnified. I have a handful of hard copies if you actually want a sheet. But to try to save paper, I didn't necessarily print out one for everyone. Um, but if you'd like one, please raise your hand, and we're happy to bring one by. Put this up. I will zoom it in. Can everyone sort of everyone read that OK on the, on the screen? Yeah. OK. Question? Yeah. 